Gladwell, the author of Blink and The Tipping Point, recently explained why he thinks people should get back into the office. Stop being bums. What's wrong with you? Okay. So he, by the way, neglected to mention his entire career has been spent working wherever he wants to work, including on his own sofa. We'll get to that in a moment. But here's the context Gladwell made these comments on the Diary of a CEO podcast. Gladwell is best known for his books, but he also, by the way, co-founded Pushkin Industries, which is an audio content company. Apparently, Gladwell's employees at Pushkin Industries do not want to come back into the office, and he has thoughts about that. So let's take a listen. As we face the battle that all organizations are facing now in getting people back into the office, that this people, it's really hard to explain this core psychological truth, which is, we want you to have a feeling of belonging and to feel necessary. We, and we want to, you to join our team. And if you're not here, it's really hard to do that. It's not in your best interest to work at home. I know it's a hassle to come to the <laughs> office. But like, you know, if you work, if you're just sitting in your pajamas in your bedroom, is that the work life you want to live, right? Don't you want to feel part of something? My favorite smear of individuals who want to work from home is the idea that they're all just lazy bums who sit around in their pajamas, which to be clear, as long as you're taking care of your responsibilities, you're getting your work done, who cares if you're doing it naked, who cares? But they they like to paint this picture of people who want to work from home because they just want to completely distract from the fact that there are economic concerns tied with wanting to work from home. For instance, if you are a woman who has children, it's very unlikely you're gonna be able to afford astronomical prices associated with childcare. So being able to work from home helps alleviate that financial burden. They don't talk about that. There's also the insanely high gas prices. Yes, they've been coming down, but let's keep it real, they're still extremely high, not having to pay for gas to go into the office is lifting a financial burden for workers in this country. They don't address that. Instead, they talk about, oh, they just like to wear pajamas and lay around all day. (laughs) And then they also love to pretend as if coming into the office is what connects you to human beings. Like that is that is the number one priority because God forbid you might have a deeper connection with other people around you, like family members or friends. God forbid you might have a little bit of extra time to go out there and exercise instead of being stuck in a car during a lengthy commute. God forbid. None of these things get addressed by people like Malcolm Gladwell was. Look, I I I'm gonna, I'm gonna zig here just a little bit. Do in you the think? sense that Like Malcolm Gladwell, I am generally just annoyed by Gen Z and a lot of my millennial cohort. Like I really do think we're so freaking navel gazy, so sensitive and just annoying a lot of the time. So I understand his his instinct to go against everything and anything that Gen Zers and younger millennials are about, right? Like these people are so self-absorbed and it's like, oh, I can't bring myself to go to the office. Oh, I, I get where Malcolm Gladwell is coming from. However, like Chief, you, you gotta look yourself in the mirror if you have created a work environment that nobody wants to be a part of. Mm-hmm. Um, like it, it's you. it starts at the top, if at your company, Nobody wants to show up, nobody wants to be around, nobody's feeling the camaraderie and the sort of, you know, the team first energy within your company. That's something you have not cultivated. And so therefore to to ask people to just come in and automatically feel that is ridiculous. And then, you know, I would say to Malcolm Gladwell, show me some data, please. Uh, Just show me the stats that show your company somehow works worse. Because people are at home now. Right. Okay, like just please provide some proof that something is actually lost from your company. You know, like, and that's what I would say. Like, come on, bro. Like, you're the CEO, you're the founder. If there's a culture that people don't feel infected by, they don't feel inspired by, that's your failure. Mm-hmm. Period. 
Well, Stephen Bartlett, who's the host of this podcast that Gladwell was on, agreed with Gladwell because according to him, this is my favorite statement ever, people don't know what's right for them. Let's listen. And this is a controversial thing to say. People don't typically know what's right for them. And, and I'm not saying this just in the context of work. I'm saying like, look at other areas of our life where we've sacrificed community for productivity or efficiency, where maybe we now sit at home and tap a glass screen to get our food and then swipe on a glass screen to get a date and then click double tap uh, photos. Like that's probably what you would have chosen f- through convenience, but mm-hmm. then the cost on happiness, which you don't get to see when you make that transaction. Make it easier and financially suitable for people to bear the financial costs of coming into the office. It's that easy. It's that easy. And also, I'm gonna say something that is practiced here at our company. It's practiced at every company at this point, and I think it's stupid. The open concept work environment where you're all in one big room and you're all expected <laughs> to be productive as multiple conversations are happening simultaneously in the same room. And by the way, the people engaging in those conversations are working, right? They're having conversations about whatever their responsibilities are. So you can't blame them, but at the same time, it's like, it ain't, it, it ain't working out, okay? And like the people, by the way, people who complain about the noise and the distractions the most are the ones who are like eager for everyone to come back into the office. And it's like, then don't complain to me about how you can't focus. <laughs> it's driving me nuts. But anyway, that's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> uh, Waz, what do you think? I think that nobody can ever accuse Anna Kasparian of not keeping it real on this damn show <laughs> because she just lodged and filed the HR complaint live on air. She's done with the open air, open concept office, y'all. Get this woman a corner office so she can <laughs> lock her door and work in peace. ASAP, thank you. Very much. Hope Jenk is listening to this. <laughs> no, but I mean, you got to read for the show and research for the show. And it's hard. It's hard to focus. But anyway, put my pet peeves aside because that's irrelevant. Sure. Um, it's no, people do know what's best for them. Mm-hmm. People know what's best for them, which is, hey, it's actually a lot more of a cost benefit for me to just work from home. I get more work done. I'm not distracted. I, I don't have all of these costs associated with working from home. But one thing that I'll say, and they're not saying it in the context of this interview, but it is true, right? So the one argument I've heard that's supportive of making people go back into the office that I'm like, all right, they got a little bit of a point there. So like right now metros for metro systems are overrun with like crime and stuff like that. And it's because people aren't present. Like people who typically use the public transportation to get to and fro work from work um, aren't there anymore. So when there's less people around, it provides more opportunity for bad behavior, for people who want to carry out bad behavior. That is the one argument I've heard that I'm like, okay, maybe there's some truth to that. But even then, I want to see some actual evidence of it. But other than that, I mean, if you genuinely want to bring your workers back into the office, you have to address the economic concerns that your workers have. And none of that ever gets addressed. Everyone pretends like, oh yeah, all of these shortages that we have. Like the childcare shortages are real. Childcare was already expensive and now it's astronomical because a lot of the people who were employed as childcare workers decided to quit. They're like, "Mm, the same for me, I I got thrown away as soon as the pandemic started. They transitioned into other work. Now there's a shortage of childcare. And so how do you expect these parents to afford something they can't afford and get themselves back into the office? These things never get addressed. Yeah, that's that's issue number one. Um, What are the economic realities of commuting to work Uh, in New York? Man, that that Metro card's gotta be at like $250 a month for monthly at this point and that's like a that's like a bargain realistically Long Island Railroad was always like way more than that uh and again like you said parking gas etc it, it, it's crazy and then you know child care all that stuff it, it it becomes a huge burden and and like i said man if there are people at that job that your employees enjoy the company of if they think they their experience of working is enriched 
by being physically close to the people who they work with, then you know you get you can come. It won't be hard for you to come up with the proper enticements to get people inside of that office. Failing that, like you need to shut up and just make it better for folks. Hundred percent. Now let's get to Malcolm Gladwell because back in 2020 <laughs> he actually published something that's telling. Because they love rules for the not for me and you see it play out in what he had written previously. So in a Wall Street Journal op ed from 2020, Gladwell called himself someone who writes in coffee shops for a living while saying quote, everyone hates the kind of people who write in coffee shops. Back in 2005, Gladwell told The Guardian about his workspace and said quote, I hate desks. Desks are now banished. Instead, he said, he starts his day with his laptop on his sofa, sounds lovely, but he doesn't know what's best for him, Waz. I think that's the problem here. He doesn't know what's best for him. It's up to us to tell him what's best for him, right? Gladwell said he rotates around different places in New York City for work. His office at the New Yorker was not one of those places, as noted in a 2008 profile of Gladwell in New York Magazine that said his editors don't see him in the office very often. Owing to his self-professed aversion to Midtown, <laughs> the profile went on to mention that Gladwell was accommodated with couriers, couriers to pick up his fact-checking materials, so he wouldn't have to go into the office. Amazing. It's just amazing. <laughs> amazing. Um, I will say this, I, I didn't realize I had all these things in common with Malcolm Gladwell. Um, one, I too start my work day on the couch with my laptop. That is a thing that I do as well. And two, and uh, I also hate Midtown Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> Generally speaking, if you can avoid it, I'm one of those snobby New Yorkers who said, "Ugh, oh, I can't be bothered to go past 14th Street." Uh, I'm I'm one of those people. So, shout to Malcolm Gladwell for being a a Midtown snob as well. Are you not the fairest? I think you might beat Jank now in being the fairest man in the country, if not the world, uh, for giving him props after he's so <laughs> unbearable. Uh, in, you know his demands look, for people is, to go back look, to the this, office. This, Rich guy detachment from reality is just what it is, right? Like these guys, they can't relate to being that normal, you know, sixty thousand dollar making twenty something year old. Like Malcolm Gladwell is so far removed from that reality. Like, how can he speak to it in any sensible way? Yeah, seriously, that's a, that's a really good point, and. You know, he doesn't know what's best for him. Uh, he needs to make efforts to not be so detached uh, from the common man <laughs> and what their needs and concerns are. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, I really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun, but you also get Playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all of that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.